What's up guys, it's Tommy and welcome to a brand new Liverpool news video where we will talk about uh, Ruben Amorim and the latest updates on uh, the potential appointment of Ruben Amorim as the next Liverpool manager and also the Portuguese newspapers are reporting that if Ruben Amorim becomes the next Liverpool manager he would like to take some of his previous sporting players to Liverpool and especially because Liverpool are in need of signing a centre-back and the sporting have two really talented centre-backs on their books uh, Gonzalo Inacio and Diomande they are both extremely talented and Liverpool want to replace Joao Matip whose contract expires at the end of the season with a new young really really talented centre-back so we will talk about all that but also we will talk about the Champions League games and incredible drama and entertainment that was on show yesterday evening. Uh, let me know what do you think about the controversial refereeing decisions. I'm referring to especially that Arsenal player Gabriel handled the ball inside the box after referee blew the whistle. It looks like Raya takes the goal kick. Gabriel picks the ball up and then puts it down again and takes the goal kick again. So that should have been a penalty to Bayern Munich. But equally, Harry Kane should have been sent off for putting his elbow deliberately into an Arsenal defender's throat. That was a really nasty challenge. And also, I think the Bukayo Saka incident is not really a penalty because Saka takes the ball past Neuer and then instead of running towards the ball he's running towards Neuer and deliberately kicks his leg into Neuer so he wasn't really trying to score a goal and it, I don't really understand that because he takes the ball past Neuer so it's an open goal there is nobody in goal why wouldn't you try to to score a goal in that incident and the referee didn't give a penalty VAR didn't overrule that so yeah let me know what do you think about these uh, controversial refereeing incidents and we will talk about more on the Champions League later but the biggest news is that Portuguese outlet Jornal Noticitas had reported has reported that Ruben Amorim is still in negotiations with Liverpool his agent is still in talks with Liverpool and he could look to bring Gonzalo Inacio Usmane Diomande and Morten Humland to Liverpool if he is appointed as Liverpool's next manager and I'm really intrigued especially about Inacio and Diomande I think Inacio already has enough experience to become the next Liverpool great centre-back. Diomande is still uh, young and pretty raw and he doesn't have a lot of experience playing uh, international football and also playing a lot of seasons in the Portuguese league. And Humeland, a uh, similar scenario, he's a pretty new signing for Sporting. But Inacio, I think, would be an absolutely fantastic transfer. Liverpool's interest in Gonzalo Inacio precedes uh, our interest in Ruben Amorim. The ball-playing defender, as he was seen as a very hot prospect in Europe even last summer Liverpool were toying with the idea of going for Inacio. Liverpool have already scouted Inacio for more than a year. He's only 22 years old but he already has a few uh, appearances for the Portuguese national team. He already scored uh, for the Portugal national team and he already has multiple seasons of uh, top flight football experience in the Portuguese league. There is no doubt Liverpool would need to refresh their backline sooner rather than later. Alongside Joao Matip's long-term injury, Van Dijk is also not getting younger at 32 years old, so Liverpool might need to sign a player who can be a great at Liverpool centre-back for the next 5 to 10 years. I also think Konate is absolutely fantastic, but he's a little bit injury-prone and Liverpool probably should have managed him a little bit differently. I didn't understand why Konate was playing the Sheffield United game and not the Man United game. Yes, he got a knock against Sheffield United and maybe you can crop thought he can play both games, but why not play Kwanzaa in the Sheffield United game and play Konate in the Man United game? So Konate should, be re should have been rested for the Sheffield United game because I think Kwanzaa, as great as he is, still only a 21-year-old, pretty inexperienced centre-back and he was great against Man United apart from that one horrendous mistake so I wonder what would have happened if Konate starts the Man United game maybe the result would have been different because apart from, until Kwanzaa's big mistake Man United had absolutely no chances they didn't have a sniff yes they had a few opportunities in the first five minutes 
but they didn't really create anything. So maybe Kwanzaa should have started the Sheffield United game and Konate the, the Man United game. So now I really hope that Kwanzaa starts the Atalanta game and then Konate plays on the weekend against Crystal Palace. Uh, that's how Liverpool should manage them. Good news is that Diogo Jota is back in training and Alisson and Trenton Asano, they are all back in training. So hopefully Jota can maybe come on as a substitute against Atalanta and then hopefully he can start against Crystal Palace. That would be absolutely fantastic. Jota is our best finisher apart from Mo Salah and I think we desperately missed him especially against Man United, he would have scored two goals from these chances that we created. So let's talk about Dinasio. He has made already 130 appearances for Sporting. So he is pretty experienced and he's, that is quite an achievement for a player who is still only 22 years old. Usmane Diomande is another centre-back that Amorim could want to bring to Anfield. He's only 20 years old and he was part of the Ivory Coast squad that won the Africa Cup of Nations. He made 32 appearances across all competitions this season. Humland is a rookie pretty much. He only arrived at Sporting last summer for just 18 million euros. He's defensive midfielder, 24 year old. He could be the long-term successor to Fabinho, but I think we have Endo already in that position. And um, I'm not sure if we would need a backup considering Pajetic is now in training and uh, he should be the backup to Endo, Endo in my opinion. But uh, we have an analysis from the Breaking the Lines out news outlet about uh, Humland. He, they say he has effectively replaced Manuel Ugarte's tenacity of the ball and he provided much needed leadership to Sporting. He is capable of playing the defensive midfield role to perfection with a positional discipline that allows him to sit just in front of the defense when Sporting is out of possession, preventing opponents from testing the goalkeeper from long range, quickly progressing play after winning the ball or receiving a pass. So yes, Humland is a good talent, Diomande is a good talent, but I want Inacio because I want players who are not just talents, who, who also have experience to come in and play at Liverpool straight away. Because the new manager needs quality and he needs experience. And yes, we have Van Dijk, we have Konate, we have Joe Gomez. I also don't understand why. Why is Jurgen Klopp not playing Joe Gomez uh, at centre-back? Because the Gomez-Van Dijk partnership is still the best centre-back partnership at Liverpool with the highest win ratio. So yes, I understand that Gomez is a backup to Conor Bradley at right back until Trent Oxford comes back. But now that Trent is back in training, I really hope that Gomez gets more games as a centre back because he's pretty great at centre back. And maybe we should start with Gomez and Kwanzaa as the centre back pairing against Atalanta so we can rest Van Dijk and uh, Konate for the weekend game because I see the Premier League as the much more important competition than the Europa League and I think we can beat Atalanta even with our second choice centre-backs. And the last player that is linked with Liverpool is Marcus Edwards. Uh, Fabrizio Mano confirmed previously that Liverpool are looking to sign an attacker and Marcus Edwards is English and he's an absolutely electric, uh, pacey winger with a lot of flair, dribbling ability, speed. And he's an interesting one, given Edwards would count towards the homegrown quota at Liverpool. There is talk of Luis Diaz uh, potentially going to Paris Saint-Germain. I might make a video about that with all the details tomorrow. It makes complete sense for Amorim to want players he knows at the club. So I expect at least maybe one player coming from Sporting that Amorim coached uh, to Liverpool is going to be one of the strangest things happening that Jurgen Klopp's longevity means we haven't seen an overhaul like this at Liverpool for, for almost a decade. So it will be a strange feeling that the new manager is walking in the door with new ideas, new tactical things, but I think they, they are still uh, great times uh, for the Liverpool players. And Dominic Soboslai, my fellow Hungarian, summed it up perfectly that regardless of who the manager is, you would still want to sign for Liverpool as a player, because Soboslai didn't sign for Liverpool just because Jurgen Klopp was the manager. He signed for Liverpool because Liverpool are one of the biggest clubs in the world and he wanted to play for them in the Premier League and in the Champions League, of course. We we will play in the Champions League next season. Dominic Savasley said, if Liverpool want to sign you, you are not thinking, thinking about anything else 
But having Jurgen Klopp as the manager is, of course, an extra incentive. He called me, we had a good talk before I signed, and he said he wants me, and I said I want to join you. So it's a quick decision. This is football, this is how it works. Klopp is going to leave and, we ha and have some break and enjoy his life. He has done this Liverpool job for a l very long time. We don't know who is coming next, but we are ready. It doesn't matter who is coming. Alexis McAllister signed before me and he was the number 10. I don't really know which numbers were open, but when they said that the number 8 was open, I said I didn't want to listen to the other numbers. I said yes, I would like to take it. They said okay, we will have to think about it, because it's a heavy number, Steven Gerrard used to wear it. And then they came back and said I could have the number 8. It was not because I was taking his number that I talked about Gerrard, he just texted me asking if there was anything he could help with in Liverpool or finding a house or whatever I need then I can text him the club has helped with everything but if I would need anything then I would text Gerard and so was Lays also talked about his uh, position on the pitch that uh, he likes to attack uh, more than he likes to defend he doesn't re he didn't really like the defensive midfield position but at Liverpool he said that he started to like it a, a little bit more if it's my choice I stay like how it is now I can attack and defend I'm going to do both as long as I can. I will see if I lose my power a little bit when I get older and I will and I will choose if I want to attack or defend more. Time will tell. I won't think about it now. If the manager puts me a little bit in defense I'm going to play there. If he puts me a little bit in offense I'm going to play there as well. Uh, my Hungary manager Marco Rossi told me, so as they said, I could be the next Pirlo because he knows I didn't like to play defensive midfield. With the time now I've played here at Liverpool a little bit more defense. I probably like it maybe. As time goes on I have to think about it but I don't want to be the next Pirlo. Of course he's a great player and legend but I want to do it my own way. Yeah, so as wants to be so as he doesn't want to be the next this or that or the other and the next Gerard. I think those comparisons were a little bit too early. He was very unlucky not to score against Man United. The first uh, two chances that he had, uh, Onana made a fantastic save and also some other players could have passed to him. Uh, Conor Bradley and Darwin Nunez could have passed to Soboslai and he could have scored a decisive goal. But I hope that the goals will come again for Soboslay because I think he has such a great technique, such great shot on him, so much power and accuracy. He just needs to be maybe a little bit more confident to shoot on goal when he's in and around the box because that's what I feel was missing against Man United. Maybe we should have shot when we paused, maybe we should have paused when we shot. The final final little bit, the extra, the decision making was just not there against Man United. We missed so many good opportunities. Also good news that the points deductions are not going away. Uh, Rob Dorsett is reporting for Sky Sports that the Premier League points deductions are here to stay for financial breaches. So clubs who br break the profit and sustainability rules can expect to continue to be sanctioned via points deductions. And the idea of this new luxury task, ta tax sorry, is not under consideration by the Premier League. That's what the reporter is saying. So that's really, really good news. And hopefully Man City will get properly punished as well. I also want to use my platform to speak out against the Liverpool Football Club increasing ticket prices. The Spy and Cup put in um, an put out an announcement saying that we are disappointed in Liverpool Football Club's decisions towards ticket prices for next season. In response, there will be no flags on the cup for the Atalanta game on Thursday night. Unlike the club's own approach, this has been agreed in consultation with other fan groups. And that's the problem that the club didn't really consult with uh, the different fan groups that are operating in Liverpool. And uh, Liverpool are making record revenues, so sh they shouldn't increase ticket prices, they should be actually reducing them because uh, life is getting more and more expensive, uh, not just in the UK but around the world and it looks like there was little consultation and little consideration for uh, the actual fans who are going to games. 
2% in terms of monetary amount is absolutely nothing to, to Liverpool. But it's maybe a start of substantially increasing ticket prices because if you increase just 2% every season, that sooner or later fans will be priced, uh, like proper fans will be priced out of the stadium. Look at the German model. Bayern Munich aren't increasing their ticket prices because they say that they, if they increase the ticket prices, it would add an extra 2 million on top of their revenue and that's nothing for a club like Bayern Munich. It's similar to Liverpool, but the mentality in England and in many other countries is totally different to the mentality in Germany. In Germany, a young university student can afford to go to a game because ticket prices are so low. But in England, more and more young people are priced out and that affects the atmosphere and that could affect in turn the, f the actual team as well. But let me know how do you see the ticket price increase, do you agree with it or do you think it's just 2%, uh, it shouldn't be you know, mentioned. Uh, I think 2% is too much when Liverpool are making, making so much money. I mean just add another sponsorship to your already extensive sponsorship portfolio and boom, you are earning more money than with the 2% ticket prices. I don't think fans should fork out any more money on tickets because they are buying a lot of merchandise, a lot of, uh, you know, shirts and kits. I mean, look at the home kit, look at the official home kit, how expensive that is. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching, have a nice day. See you later guys, goodbye.